Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. We're so delighted to have with us today Stan Shelley from Shelley and Son Books, which is a member of the Independent Online Booksellers Association. He is located in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and we wanted to invite him to share some of his fun discoveries as a book collector. He specializes in books by several of our authors, but first, thank you for joining us today, Stan. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to be here. One of the things that we want to hear from you is about some fun discoveries you've made. Yeah, that, um, that's part of the, actually, that's the fun of the rare book business. It's like a treasure hunt, and, uh, and particularly relative to the Inklings and the seven authors. Uh, you, every time I get a, a chance to look at a book, I, I open it up just to see who previously owned it. And once in a rare while, I get an association copy that was owned by somebody that I know was uh, related to uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, uh, one book I, I got, uh, C.S. Lewis had a friendship by correspondence with Arthur C. Clarke. They both admired each other's science fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a copy of The Last Battle, which was signed by Lewis, uh, but it was also owned by Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, so that makes it uh, a, a cool item. Right. Hmm. So you're getting the double double dipping yeah. in significance. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to focus on the seven authors that the Wade collects as somewhat of your specialty as a bookseller and book buyer. Yeah. In the early 2000s, I, I started doing rare books uh, as a part-time thing because I just loved it. And uh, as I got more serious, I realized I needed to get some education about it. And there's a one-week class in Colorado Springs every summer. So I attended that class. And in the course of that week, one thing they said was, you really need to have a specialty. And uh, in just a matter of an hour or two, I decided on uh, the Inklings and the Seven uh, as the category. Uh, to the people there, and even to me, it sounded like kind of a narrow niche. Uh, but I was doing books part time, and uh, it has turned out not to be nearly as narrow mm -hmm. as as yeah. one would think when you mm -hmm. start thinking of each of them had a a world around them. Like for instance, with C.S. Lewis, I start doing Joy's books and uh, Roger Langell and Green's books. I mean, anybody related to Lewis, I'm interested in their books. And is there something of a halo effect to someone like Charles Williams or Owen Barfield? As they're associated with Lewis or the seven authors, does that increase the value or the interest in their works? Yes, uh, some. Uh, they uh, obviously are not as much in demand as C.S. Lewis's books, but the fact that they were uh, distinctly in his orbit, uh, they, uh, that increases interest in them. Uh, Charles Williams has, to some degree, an orbit of his own, uh, mm -hmm. and so does Owen Barfield. Uh, a little bit in in some of the um, uh, anthroposophic is it, did I say that right? Uh, yeah, but uh, they both also benefit strongly from the relationship of um, uh, with Lewis, and that reminds me of a book I I ordered a book that had a chapter had chapters by multiple authors, one chapter by Owen Barfield. So I ordered the book and I got it. it looked nice. I start flipping through it, and when I come to the Owen Barfield chapter. I see that he signed that chapter, which oh. the seller didn't know, and I didn't oh. know when I bought it. <laughs> and uh, I, I know his signature, so I was pretty sure it was right, but I, I sent a picture of it to his grandson anyway just to confirm the authenticity of it, and uh, it was really, uh, really signed by him. How do you assess the authenticity of signatures? Do you ever come across false signatures? Yeah, I, I have made one big mistake, and... And, you know, when I bought it, there was something in me that said, be careful here. And I didn't listen to that something. Mm -hmm. And uh, consequently, I, I bought a, a bad autograph and, and uh, I did not get compensated for it. But that, mm -hmm. that, that's going to happen. But I, by now, I know most of the signatures quite well. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm 
I'm pretty so when good. you get a bad autograph, does that mean someone was illicitly trying to sell something as authentic that wasn't authentic? In this case, that's correct. Oh, yeah, because wow. it it was close to the right. You know, if if somebody scrolled C.S. Lewis in a, in a book because they're just making a note about it or something, then the handwriting is not going to be similar, and there's no no attempt to deceive. Uh, but sometimes, of course. Uh, especially with Tolkien and Lewis, because the value is higher. Mm. Uh, one has to be careful. I think your clue should have been it was signed Elwin Ransom. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's a fictional character. Yeah. <laughs> Which should have been the tip-off. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's surprises in collecting. You think Mickey Mantle will be the baseball card or Derek Jeter, but it turns out that's not the valuable card. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, in diamond buying. They talk about the four C's of buying a good diamond uh, tell us about the basics of book buying and book selling and then some of the exceptions of what we would think would be a really valuable book, which maybe is not. Yes. Uh, the uh, Many book dealers would say, okay, the, the most important three things in, in books are condition, condition, and condition. Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's – and that's that, – there's a huge truth there, but it's not entirely true. If, if, uh, if you offered me – uh, first edition of Spirits in Bondage, and it was in pretty rough shape. I would still offer you a lot of money for it mm. because it is so, so rare. Uh, so uh, condition is very important. Dust jackets are probably more important than most people think, um, especially in fiction. In fiction, a, uh, a dust jacket can sometimes be 80% of the value wow. of, of a first edition. So... Um, uh, like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with the Dust Jacket first edition is in the thousands, uh, but without the Dust Jacket, it's in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, the Dust Jacket is hugely important. And the reason for that is they're very fragile. Books actually are kind of tough. You can drop them and usually not mm -hmm. damage them. But Dust Jackets are very easily damaged. And then, of course, a lot of times they're disposed of. They're not even present. Mm -hmm. So uh, just in terms of supply and demand, there's a, a lesser supply. So mm. dust jackets are real important. Association copies are very important. I mentioned the Arthur C. Clarke. Um, uh, the, that's important. And even minor associations. I, I had a dictionary once that was the, pre the, the owner of it was a man named Craigie, who I just happened to remember was – uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's tutor in phil philology oh. is that am I saying it right? Yeah. Uh, philology is the study of words, and and Craigie was kind of the guy that got him started right. uh, in in that. And I had a dictionary that was owned by Craigie, so oh. uh, that raised the price of that particular dictionary. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice that prices went up after the Tolkien movies came out or the Narnia movies came out? I would say they went up a little bit, but they were already so strong. Mm. Tolkien is probably, you know, authors kind of rise and fall and come and go. Uh, but Tolkien is probably on one of the longest runs of any oh. author. Mm. Uh, his stuff has been strong for a very long time. Mm. Uh, and and so the movies um, definitely helped stabilize and probably did increase things a little bit. Uh, but they were already so strong. He 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 has the most devoted fans. Mm. Uh, yes, so. right. He said in a letter before it got published, I'm not sure this may just be a private amusement. He wasn't even sure if it was uh, publishable, That a lot of that project. Yes, uh, uh, obviously. Yeah, I mean, many people have heard that it took C.S. Lewis's encouragement to get him to uh, even uh, even try to get it published mm -hmm. and actually a lady who had heard about the hobbit from somebody else literally went to his door and knocked on the door huh? a, mm -hmm. a total stranger but she was from a london publishing company and she said somebody told me about this book would you would you let me take it to london and show it to some people and he did and uh that led to the publishing of the hobbit See, now that hardly ever happens to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, when you read uh, Tolkien's letters, it, after The Hobbit went well, The Lord of the Rings was, they called it The New Hobbit because it was going to be the sequel. And it's a little bit charming and a little bit heartbreaking that he says, I hope to have the sequel done by 1939. Well, I think 1942. Well, 1940. Literally, mm -hmm. he always thinks he's getting ready to turn the corner and finish that up. Yeah. 
and it took till almost 1950. Of course, it was brilliant once it was finished, but that became a and very the, large well, project. Even after he finished it, then I go into the, all these negotiations with the publisher where he wants the Silmarillion published also, oh, right, right. and they didn't want to do it. So he he was not a good businessman, but he thought he was going to get another publisher involved and play one against the other, and then it ended up they both said no, <laughs> and, and he got himself in trouble, but he eventually it got saved. And finally, uh, he he wrote a letter to the publisher that more or less said, just publish any of this mess you want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they both had their humbling experiences along yeah. their publishing uh, careers. But I love the fact that here at the Wade, we have the desk where Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, wrote much of yes. The Lord of the Rings, and we even have the pen yes. with which he wrote those yes. amazing texts. And what about that dip pen, Crystal? Well, why don't you tell them, David? <laughs> well, I didn't know that till we got here, but... Uh, I think Christopher, no, it wasn't Christopher Tolkien. It was um, uh, the author of the, Humphrey Carpenter. He donated the, Tolkien's dip pen, and the side with the nib has ink stains on it, but the other side has brown stains on it. And apparently, <laughs> he used it to tamp his pipe while he was writing. I've heard so that. So he was multitasking. So it's a great <laughs> artifact in terms of his, his creative methods. Yeah, yeah. I, I think tobacco was a big part of uh, Lewis and Tolkien's life. <laughs> well, you can see that in Lord of the Rings. Uh, Almost every major character. The only time I can find that it goes into Gandalf's mind, he can't decide which of the three doors are the right one to get out of the mines of Moria. So it goes into his consciousness, which is unusual for Lord of the Rings. He says, I need to sit down and have a smoke to clear my mind to figure out which is the right door. <laughs> and I go, I think this was written by a nicotine addict. You know? <laughs> I love what you were saying about desk jackets because... As I look at the many books we have here at the Wade with the dust jackets from first editions, I will look much more closely knowing now that that is 80% of the value of these old, old books. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, they're so important. And they're, uh, you have to look closely at them. Joy Davidman's book, uh, Smoke on the Mountain, uh, the first edition, first American edition, which was the first edition, um, so far I have found four different variations of the dust jacket hmm. on hmm. the same first edition book. Uh, huh. it's, it starts out, the first du dust jacket doesn't mention C.S. Lewis at all, uh, and then there's that dust jacket has two different variations of a number in the corner, and then, then there's an, on the back of the next dust jacket it says she's married to C.S. Lewis, and then the last dust jacket says, uh, when living, she was married to C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And all of those are on the same first edition book. Mm -hmm. so. Our edition of Smoke on the Mountain says, Smoke on the Mountain, and then Joy David and Smaller, and then down below it says, Forward by C.S. Lewis. Yes. And the letters are the same height as the title of the book. So you can tell that his name is magic when yes. it comes to selling books. And, but that's not in the first edition. Uh, oh, his, is that right? his forward is not in. That's one way you identify the first edition is the, the lack of the forward uh, in the book. Uh, mm. and, but when the British did the book, they put the forward in. Mm. Have you ever sold books by Dorothy Sayers? Yes, I have sold uh, lots of first editions and uh, uh, some letters written by her. Uh, her, her letters I, I love because uh, the, the ones I've had, I haven't had that many, but they, some friend of yours typically writes her and she's writing back and she writes with such courtesy. One friend was an actress uh, who I looked up online and she was a fairly prominent elderly British lady who played the, 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 Grand Dame in the English theater, and mm. she was asked, apparently had written Dorothy Sayers asking that Dorothy write a play for them, you know, and Dorothy very kindly wrote back and said, I'm so busy, and I'm writing mostly uh, cathedral uh, theater uh, dramas, and, and so she politely declined, but the, the kindness with which she wrote mm -hmm. was really sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she also could get pretty feisty if someone wrote her something she had trouble with. There's one letter we have where she starts the letter saying, Oi, oi, I see I must write you another letter. <laughs> it was to C.S. Lewis, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, it was yeah. to C.S. Lewis. Yeah, yeah I, I can see that. Uh, uh, she was uh, a 
an intensely intelligent lady. Mm -hmm. uh, you can almost see that in her visage when you see a picture. Mm -hmm. And so that, that doesn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that you were telling us about the other day, you had found a letter by someone to C.S. Lewis in a book by Herbert Palmer. Could you share that with us? Yes. First, tell us how how you discovered this I, I was i don't remember exactly what i was searching for on the internet but it was something related to c.s lewis in the book world and i came across this book and i read the description and the more i read the better it sounded so i just ordered the book uh, and it turned out that and then i looked in uh the three volume set of of uh, lewis letters and i saw that the poet herbert palmer had written lewis and he responded with uh, kind words, and he said, we need to get together sometime. And they apparently uh, had to change the date two or three times, but eventually they did get together. So this book uh, that I have, I have it in my hand here, it's written by Herbert Palmer. It's called uh, A Sword in the Desert. And in it, he has he's giving this book as a birthday present to a friend of his named Edgar. We don't know who Edgar is. Uh, and he just... He does a salutation, and then the whole page is uh, about the uh, uh, the meeting he recently had with C.S. Lewis, and he describes Lewis as a convivial Irishman and so forth. Uh, but then the, the last paragraph is very interesting. He, uh, speaking about Lewis, he says, uh, he doesn't like women, says all the women he knows are all saints or devils, chiefly devils. Hell, I presume, from his standpoint, is chiefly populated by women so <laughs> so they must have had some some interesting conversation uh, so well and of course then since we were just talking about Sayers Sayers was a large reason that he changed that opinion because he encountered this brilliant woman and my theory is that it was Sayers intelligence and willingness to engage in intellectual uh, back and forth with Lewis that prepared him for Joy David men. Yes, I, I think you're probably right there. Uh, uh, Lewis seems to have changed through the years. And, mm -hmm. and also, like a lot of people uh, who have uh, probably inappropriate feelings toward a group, uh, of people, but when they meet an individual in that group, all of a sudden, right. uh, their their feeling is right. very different. You can uh, make the uh, you can see the same process with Americans. Some of his earlier uh, comments on Americans in his letters, he says, "I really like uh, Hawthorne's writing. Too bad he's a beastly American." Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then elsewhere, he said someone had an article that didn't come out well and didn't make sense, and the evidence wasn't there. So he said, oh, I'll just send it off to an American journal. Yeah. <laughs> so he tended to revel in that sort of thing early on. But as he met so many Americans coming across and discovered that his main audience for a while was Americans, or at least the large proportion of his audience, yes. I think his attitude yes. softened quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, similar with T.S. Eliot, uh, uh, he was very critical of T.S. Eliot's poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of carried over to being critical of T.S. Eliot. But when they met, uh, Eliot was so kind and gracious to him that uh, the, uh, Lewis warmed quickly right. uh, to Eliot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said, when I met him, I loved him at once, which was a generous yeah. response to mm -hmm. someone who you've been yes. tangling with for several decades yes. in, in and critical that, reviews. A lot of credit goes to Eliot for uh, the courtesy of, of his response. Mm -hmm. yeah. And two, some people like to indict individuals for their prejudices, but what uh, postmodern theory has made very clear is that we're all embedded in uh, certain cultural discursive practices. In other words, Lewis was just reflecting the culture in which he was a part, especially at Oxford and um, it was quite the men's club. So he had just internalized all these various attitudes, as we all do. And that goes back to what you're saying. Once you meet individuals that provide a counterexample to what you have assimilated, you suddenly realize, oh, my goodness, my culture has 
given me an inaccurate sense of this particular group of mm-hmm. of people. Yes. I I had uh, I bought some correspondence one time that Joy Davidman had written to American relatives, and uh, one of the letters I've got a copy of it here uh, kind of shows how Lewis has. Uh, evolved the the letter I read a moment ago about uh, women being chiefly devils that was 1946 uh, and then in 1958 uh, she is uh, Joy Davidman is writing to her relatives and she says thanks for your good wishes on my marriage uh, and then she says some negative things about her first marriage uh, but then she says, with Jack, that's C.S. Lewis, with Jack, the only problem is to keep him from working too hard and sacrificing himself to all the rest of us. He is really a saint, and that's not a word I use lightly. In addition, he's got ten times Bill's charm and brains and talent and wit, and he's as merry as a cricket, and as you can see, I'm overwhelmingly in love with him. Uh, is in that and obviously uh that's that's very sweet sentiment but in a sense uh Lewis had kind of earned that sort of love with the the courtesy and respect with which he he treated joy now, yeah, it's also we as media figures giving equal time to differing perspectives mm-hmm. to hear from <laughs> both first and I wonder what he said to uh the poet that that cuz that's actually his impressions of the conversations that's right, not Lewis yeah, speaking right. But I'd love to get the first-hand comments from yes. Lewis and see how they were interpreted. Yes. But that's a lovely letter from Joy, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And how do you learn about these letters for sale? Um, I bought one letter from this man. He offered it on the Internet, mm. and uh, I bought it. And uh, then I asked him if there was more, and he said, I'm— I'm pretty sure that box in the attic has some more. And and it turned out there were quite a few more. And then there was one book uh, inscribed by Joy to her aunt and uncle, Mm. uh, which I bought. And uh, for a while there, I had quite a run of of good things. Uh, uh, I mentioned association copies. I had the copy of, of her first novel, Anya, which she inscribed to Bill Kaufman, who uh, was the author, I think, of Up the Down Staircase, mm-hmm. and, and she was uh, Joy's best friend. Uh, so that's, a, that's an important book, uh, and uh, I, I ended up with the copy. She inscri- and she, she inscribed it with, uh, a, I don't remember the inscription, but it was, it was witty and humorous uh, to her best friend. Uh, and she was a brilliant woman. Abby Santa Maria's biography of Joy, just outlining all the writing awards that Joy Davidman was getting. And she was, Joy Davidman was spending time with some of the big names in the early part of the 20th century. She Langston was. Hughes, for example. So her commendation of the how much she's in love with C.S. Lewis really weighs heavily. And I think part of the reason Lewis responded so well to her is she, like Dorothy Sayers, was a woman who could keep up with him and challenge him. And I appreciate that Mm -hmm. about Lewis, that he liked being challenged. Yes. He didn't want to be kowtowed to. He wanted to be stretched. Yeah. And, And ultimately, it didn't matter the gender of the person. Uh, yes, ma- maybe right. maybe there was a time in his life when it did, but mm-hmm. in the long run, it did not matter. I think one effect you can see of Joy is in Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. He's It's a fictional correspondence with Malcolm, but several times he says, oh, your wife made this comment, and I wanted to respond to that. So he sees himself responding to them as a couple rather than mm-hmm. an individual. I don't think that dynamic would have come up in his mind unless he'd been married to Joy just a few years earlier. That's a good point. Mm. Can I go back to the book that you mentioned, uh, the, the form of it, the piece of paper with the letter on it, mm-hmm. th- that it's pasted in the book, mm-hmm. and on the back of the book is C.S. Lewis's handwriting? Could you mention I, that a little bit? I forgot to mention that. That was 1946, right after the war. There was still a paper shortage, and the letter that the, the Herbert Palmer wrote to this Edgar, I, if you turn it over, uh, on the back of it is 
a typed note from C.S. Lewis's secretary uh, saying, I confirm the date of our meeting, sign, and it's signed by C.S. Lewis. And Palmer has scratched a line, <laughs> a line through all that and turned the paper over and reused the paper. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, if he, he had no idea, he was scratching out an autograph that was worth a lot of money in the future. Mm. Yeah, what does that do to the value of that autograph when it's been scratched out? Oh, it reduces it, but uh, it's still, uh, so there's one line through it. So it's very legible, uh, and it still has value, but it, it does diminish it right. a little bit. Are, the, are those new words by C.S. Lewis himself above the signature, saying, I can confirm this appointment? <laughs> uh, the, I, I don't understand. Was it Lewis's own handwriting? No, it was it. typed. Yeah, it was typed. Oh. His secretary typed it. I was yeah. going to say, if that was uh, some uh, young scholar could probably get an article out of that. People are always looking for new words from C.S. Lewis. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I guess there's no article in that then. No. <laughs> okay. No. But I do, that. I don't know why that brings to mind. Sometimes when I have a signature of Lewis with a specific date with it, I, uh, I, I send it to Charlie Starr, who is the, uh, the real expert on Lewis's signature, uh, because signatures change over a lifetime. Mm. And so if he can mm-hmm. have a signature with a date with it, that helps him. I, I have, uh, right now I have two contracts that C.S. Lewis signed with Dent Publishing. Uh, the first one was for Dimer in 1926. Uh, so it's got Lewis's signature on it. We've got the exact date. And then the second contract is for uh, Paradise uh, Regain. No. Oh, um Oh, Pilgrim's Regress. Pilgrim's Regress, yes, uh, 1933. And so we've got a signature on that contract, and it's dated. And that helps people who are students of the autograph. And that's the one that mentions movie rights. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, 1933, uh, Pilgrim's Regress. The <laughs> contract includes that they get the movie rights. <laughs> <laughs> so they're still out there, folks. If you've got an idea, they're available, apparently. <laughs> well, David's novel about... C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. It's called Looking for the King, and it's going to be reissued pretty soon. He by Paraclete at, Press. By Paraclete, yeah. But um, Hollywood bought up movie rights to it right away, mm-hmm. and so I think they, they're they constantly looking for material that could eventually make a good film. I'm not sure that Pilgrim's Regress would have made that good of a film. I, that would be tough. Right? Yeah. We would need an annotated copy of the movie. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> You'd have running subtitles all the way through the movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. With Shaquille O'Neal as the giant. Right? <laughs> we could make this more contemporary. Have you ever bought a whole bunch of books in order to get just one book, you knew that one book was part of a larger collection that you had to purchase? Uh, yes, I don't remember an Inklings book that I did that, but I certainly have done that in the uh, in the big uh, picture of book buying mm. for my business. Because in my business, I do all kinds of rare books. And uh, sometimes uh, you go into a home and, and uh, perhaps somebody has passed away and the, the family wants you to take the whole library and there's mm. you only want 10% of it, but you take the whole library to get that 10%. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that does remind me one time I went to a library book sale uh, and I was one of the first people in line. And so as soon as the door opened, I went straight to the religion section. And fortunately, they had all the C.S. Lewis stuff together. Yeah. And and I knew that I'd been to this book sale before and the prices were good. And so I didn't even look at the prices. I just put them all in my box. And mm. I finished shopping the, the show and then I took everything home. And when I was going through them at home, I found that I had purchased a first edition of Mere Christianity for $1. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. That's everyone's dream. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I've had a dream of buying an old lumpy chair at some antique store and going to refinish it and discovering that it was stuffed with wadded papers mm-hmm. written by Charles Dickens or Charlotte Bronte mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. that is a story that really... Comes yeah. close to my, my dream is I'm digging around the Bodleian and I find this dusty old volume, 
and it's the Red Book of Tolkien, and all this really was written down. He didn't make it up after all. <laughs> he always claims he was just doing research into Middle Earth. <laughs> uh, that would be quite a find, don't you think? Yeah, it would. It would. Mm. Uh, tell us a story about trying to authenticate a signature. You mentioned Charlie Starr and other people. Yes. And getting uh, a different outcome than perhaps you wanted. A gentleman from uh, England uh, saw on the Internet that I did a lot with the Inklings, and so he uh, sent me photographs of two books that he wanted to sell to me. Uh, and he said his great uncle had purchased them when he went to Oxford in 1916. And both books had uh, a C.S. Lewis signature crossed out and then his uncle's signature there. So it looked like C.S. Lewis had sold them to the used bookstore and then his uncle had bought them. And uh, the Lewis signature looked pretty close, but it just didn't look perfect. And then one of the two books also mentioned one of the Oxford colleges that had no association to C.S. Lewis. So there was reason to be a little careful, and I, I sent those pictures on to a couple C.S. Lewis scholars, including Laura here at the, at the Wade, and then they sent them on to a couple more. And it ended up there were four scholars involved with me, and everybody was reluctant to say that's not authentic, but everybody was reluctant to say it is authentic. And I told this to the owner. He went to Oxford to the registrar, and they looked up the original signature of C.S. Lewis. And, and we had, part of our discussion was everybody knew that at the time Lewis was at Oxford, there was a second C.S. Lewis at Oxford. Clifford Stanley Lewis was mm -hmm. also there. And uh, the registrar proved that the books had belonged to Clifford Stanley Lewis, not to our famous C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis. Uh, and so the owner after that, of course, he didn't. I, w I didn't want to buy them, but he he kindly just mailed them to me, and uh, uh, he paid the shipping across the Atlantic, mm. and, and uh, I I handed them on to the Wade Center in case anybody's ever researching and there's any question about this other C.S. Lewis. Now, now the Wade Center has a, a copy of his signatures. Mm. I hope uh, he had a distinguished career and that his family's proud of him. That would be hard for people to say, oh, my grandfather, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Your grandfather? <laughs> well, no, this was Charles Stanley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we, they hope we can be proud of his accomplishments. But it shows that scholars need to be cautious about attributions. So here was another C.S. Lewis at the very same time. Yes. Our staff bought me a book that they saw online when they were checking my books that's called... How to Get Rid of Crow's Feet by Crystal <laughs> Downing. <laughs> and they just had to get it as a joke because mm -hmm. there's another Crystal Downing out there yep. who writes books. And yep. so uh -huh. 100 years from now, I don't want people assuming that I had this secret writing career on the side. Yeah. I think yeah. you should sign it and give it to Stan and see what happens. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. You told us about sometimes people present you with a book which they think is valuable, and you have to deflate their enthusiasm by uh, bringing your expertise to the book. You think of a couple of occasions where you had to yes, bring the bad uh, news to someone? Yes, probably the most common situation is if the book, uh, uh, th there are some books that say first edition, uh, and yet they're not a first edition, and it's mm -hmm. hard to explain why, but the most common reason is uh, that it's a book club edition, and generally speaking, collectors do not want book club editions. Uh, but sometimes uh, a publisher, uh, this happened with, uh, uh, have you ever heard of Patricia, Patricia Cornwell, the, the mm. mystery yes. writer? Her very first book was a biography of Mrs. Billy Graham, Ruth Graham. Oh. And uh, the first edition of that was by Harper and Rowe. So Harper and Rowe, published it, first edition, then the Billy Graham Association, they wanted some copies for their organization. Their, I don't, you wouldn't call it a book club. Uh, but they published it under the publisher of Grayson. But uh, Harper and Rose sold them the whole, the printing set up, everything. So they just printed more of them, and it says first edition in them. Uh, mm. But they're not. If, they're, mm. if, if the book says it's published by Grayson, then it's not a first edition, even though it says it's a first edition. How and, can they get away uh, with that? Well, it's an accident. It's oh. I mean, uh, people, you know, it's business, and they, the last thing they're thinking about is the first edition attribution. So mm. I, it just happens. I, I've seen it on, on other books, too. 
So, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you have to let people down. Uh, one of the most common is uh, U.S. Grant's uh, memoirs after the war. He, mm -hmm. he was short of money, published his memoir, and there's a page in that book where in brown ink they printed his signature under his photo. And lots of people think they've got an autograph oh. U.S. Grant book. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've had to tell many people that they don't have a, an autographed book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't say if it talks like a first edition and it quacks like a first edition. <laughs> that saying never caught on in the book business. No, it apparently. didn't, didn't yeah. catch on. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you have any other questions, David? No, it's David? been great. Really, Thank you have any you other thoughts so you'd like much. to share with Did us? Did you have something else you wanted to share with us, Stan? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I've I've had all kinds of of fun uh, scouting for books. Every every time I travel, I just go in bookstores and look. So uh, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a fun uh, avocation. And I, I have enjoy one it. quick question: Have you discovered something interesting here at the Wade? Since you've been looking at our books, uh, the uh, I got to see and touch. Uh, uh, is it spirits and bondage? That the first mm -hmm. one? Yeah, I, down the uh, Laura took me down into the vaults, and I got to see that book, which is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a real thrill to see these super rare things, and mm -hmm. and uh, the Wade is very willing to. Uh, let you look at them I know. Uh, and that's the, the purpose here and and uh, yeah I just have to say uh, the helpfulness and the courtesy and the professionalism here is just extraordinary oh, thank one, you. So one last thought I the the Wade has a policy when they buy a an old copy of a book by George McDonald or C.S. Lewis or anybody else, they absolutely write nothing in it. Like most mm -hmm. libraries, you know, they stamp it and write it. And right. I mean, they ruin it almost. Uh, but the Wade Center puts a card in it with all the information they want so that they don't, even in pencil, they don't write the slightest right. thing in a book. And that's, to keep it that pristine. is marvelous. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's part of what we, we just came here last summer, but we love the, the emphasis upon quality and excellence I also say we came for the books, but we stay for the people. We yeah. really love the, some of the people you've been meeting the last few yes. days. Really yeah. enjoyable colleagues. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stan, for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure.